All right, welcome to our March 30th, 2021 uh, Club Cubase live stream. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm gonna do a quick audio test on my system, make sure everything is coming through as expected. Bear with me just for a moment. Okay, my name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for the live stream today. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask questions in the live chat field. Uh, it may be on the right-hand side of your screen, depending on how your, your web page is uh, configured. You could ask questions there, and we could, uh, questions can also be submitted in advance to Club Cubase at Steinberg dot de um today since it's the last live stream of the month the tradition we started in 2021 is we'll have a zoom meetup i posted a link uh in the chat field so if you want to join for the zoom meetup after so that way we could get a chance to put faces to names uh so you can see that and i'll kind of post that throughout the live stream periodically so we'll go for about two hours which is shorter than normal and uh, we'll have the Zoom meetup for the second half of the live stream. So, um, and if you are watching this live, if you want to uh, introduce yourself and tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America, uh, which is the U.S. distributor for Steinberg products. And I, my focus is primarily to be a Steinberg product specialist. So we will, um, I'm presenting from out uh, in the United States, uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. So if you want to tell us who you are and where you're from, and if this is your first hangout, that would be helpful. And I'm going to turn off my phone. Hang on just one second. All right, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, but uh, so if you haven't attended a live stream, you could ask your question there. You could also, if you're asking questions, make sure that you. Uh, sometimes it's helpful if we actually say I'm running Cubase 11 Pro on Mac, or I'm running uh, Cubase Elements on Windows 10 version 10. You know, stuff like that is helpful. Uh, if you don't see your question answered immediately, try to refrain from asking the question over and over again. It just kind of uh, gets uh, into, uh, just kind of slows the whole process down. And we'll go ahead and get started here. I know we have kind of a shorter live stream than usual. Um, I was planning on doing the live stream on Friday. I know it's a good Friday for a lot of people. And if that's a bad idea, you know, just leave a uh, a comment in the chat field if you don't want to do a live stream on Friday or if you do so we can uh, plan accordingly so let's go ahead and get started with some different questions and I'm just turn my phone off sorry for the interruption just had to make sure I have my wife called and just make sure everything is okay Okay, so let's go ahead and I see lots of familiar faces on the introductions here. All right, so we have a question uh, from Walter Blackledge. Uh, WaveLab Elements question. Uh, if this is off topic, please let me know. How to save a WaveLab project, a .wpr file? Is it possible in Elements? So I don't think that the Elements has that capability. So when we go to, you know, it doesn't show up as uh, like an option for saving as or for uh, importing a, 
a wave lab project and a wave lab project if you're not familiar with it could be like one like let's say if it's for a whole cd and it could be the montage the individual audio files uh, and kind of you know different components that could make up kind of a collection of different aspects of everything you needed to just work with a particular project. Um, so when we go, you know, we do the save as we could, you know, save as, uh, you know, different, uh, you know, as audio files or audio montages, but not projects. And it's something that's going to be in the pro version and not in elements. Okay. Okay, so a question from Ace Amadeus from Texas. Uh, so a question is, in, in Cubase 10.5, how do I set up so that my mixes are loud but don't go over zero dB in a mixer or final stereo output? Is there a Cubase plugin for that? So, you know, if you want it to, you know, make your mixes loud, and, and this is kind of a whole art form that, you know, sometimes people want, you know, just the one a uh, simple button solution for, but, you know, it's often the arrangements, very careful, you know, recording techniques. But, you know, if you had to have like a one button solution to make your project sound loud, it would probably be maybe like the maximizer or limiter. So let's say if I wanted to take this project here and let's say this is my master level. And if I wanted to run it through like a maximizer plugin, I could just come and you'll find it under dynamics. And if you want to just go to your maximizer and you could just kind of bring it up to get more punch out of your particular track. So if I wanted to just bypass, so you can see how like if you're just looking for that extra DB or two, of gain there's kind of a classic algorithm and a more modern so kind of two different flavors think of it like coke and pepsi but that could be a good way to do it some people will also just you know do their export audio mix down and just render the and just you know take the file and normalize it as well that's another method that people will do to kind of get more punch so those are, you know, look at like the brick wall limiter, look at the maximizer um, or rendering, you know, doing a normalize on, on after the file has been rendered as well. Okay, so we have a question. Hi, is there a way to automatically add files to the project's audio folder when you do files, import tracks from project and you import from a project that's in a different project folder. So I believe it's just a preference. Um, and you, this is one of those preferences where it, you may just have it turned off. But let's say, I think if you go to editing uh, audio, you could just say, so we'll go to our preferences, editing audio, and you could just have it to use settings. So this is one of those, things that you see a little message one time and then it says click here to not show again so if we wanted to you could just say copy all files to project folder then every time that you import uh, audio files from a different location those will automatically be moved into your project folder so once again go to editing to audio uh, and you can have it open the options dialog, uh, or you could just go to use settings and just select and put a check mark next to copy all files to project folder. <clears throat> all right. All right. Great to see Sable Winters on the hangout. All right. All right, so we just see comment, uh, I believe, let me just make mine. From Detlef, uh, Randerath, I really enjoy the Club Cubase live stream. Thank you, Greg, for this great knowledge exchange. Well, it's great, I'm glad it's helpful, and hopefully everyone learns a tip or trick. Uh, and if you do, you just have to hit the like button. All right, so make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that already. Okay, so great to see Millard Brown on a Hangout from Pennsylvania, as well as Jazz Dudes, always incredibly helpful. 
<clears throat> and does wonderful things, kind of organizing the Cubase Nation Discord. All right, so we have Uno from Finland and Taylor from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Uh, so we just see, is there a way to invert this question from Taylor? Is there a way to invert the intervals of a series of MIDI notes? So let's go ahead and give it a quick try. Okay, so I'll just add a quick instrument track. All right, let me just add one that's a little more relevant. Okay, and I'll just do a quick step entry between some notes here. So let's say I'll just do maybe like a major scale and thirds. Okay, so let's say. Okay, I'm going to just switch this to bars and beats. Okay, so. So let's say I just have a little thing and let's see if we could do some inversion here. So let me just. All right, let's just, just clean up one or two little things here. Okay, so let's say if I have these notes, uh, let's come here. I think you might see some things under, um, I'm not sure if it's inverting, but sometimes you could also do stuff like reversing. Uh, and let, let's just take a look at it again. So let's say I want to take this So under the functions menu. So I don't see a inversion as kind of a natural function. But you could do a mirror. So that's kind of almost similar to a reverse. Um, but nothing that, I don't think there's a direct uh, inversion. I'll take a quick look in the logical editor and see if there's anything uh, along those lines. So let's say, we'll say type is equal to notes and we want to take, um, Okay, so I don't think that there's a, a direct kind of interval uh, inversion process. So, um, but I could play around with it more. There could be maybe if I dive into some of the MIDI plugins, you might be able to get something, but I'll play around with it more. Taylor, if you want to send me an email. All right, great to see Paul, the guitarist from Lynchburg, Virginia, fellow Virginian. All right, uh, we have Renzo checking in from Peru. All right, we have Uno and from Finland. We have Hans, or Hans from uh, Norway. Tim from Mission Viejo has been a very loyal Zoom meetup attendee. 
All right. Uh, so we have a question. Is this a masterclass and Cubase features only or mixing techniques too? So, you know, it's kind of geared towards maybe, you know, you could ask, you know, anything with Cubase, but if it's, you know, how do I do this type of mixing technique or process utilizing Cubase? We could do that too. So any questions that you might have, um, just feel free to ask. Okay, so we see Captenergy Music. All right, and occasionally my timeline will jump on me. So I, I will try to keep up with, so we don't lose any questions. All right, so we have people checking in from Poland, UK, and Norway. Okay, so we have people saying they would attend a live stream on Friday. Okay, that's good. All right, we have Jan from Cubase Index. If you wanted to search with uh, for topics that have been covered in previous Hangouts, and we have over a year of the Hangouts since the pandemic started, uh, you could go to cubaseindex.com, and kudos to Jan for uh, having that organized. All right, so Robbie. Okay, so most people seem like they're okay on uh for friday that's fine okay so we have michael harvey from st louis all right so we have justin from prague Okay, so we have Justin asks, uh, my question is sometimes when I drag and drop a sample it goes to max volume, is this a bug? So sometimes when you have the preview volume, and I'm not sure if this carries over in Cubase elements as well. All right, so we have someone already joined our Zoom meeting. So let me just, all right. So and if I'm auditioning sounds like in the media bay, so let's say if I wanted to come here to loops or samples and we're just auditioning some different samples. Sometimes the volume um, is carried over. So let's say if I move my preview volume down. So let's say now I've placed that file and I wanted to have my preview volume up louder. So if I go to look at my mix console, you can see kind of a, a disparity in the volumes depending on, you know, maybe where. So if I have my volume almost all the way down and double click a file, you can see that those volumes from the preview are automatically carried over. So it could be maybe that the preview volume here is too loud um, and that's being carried over directly into the tracks. So for the volume for the mixer, so that it's at the same volume as what you auditioned it from. All right, great to see Agent K, who's always kind enough to do moderation for us. All right, so we have Aaron from Ontario. All right, wonderful to see, I think, hang on just one second. All right, wonderful to see Pablo Vasquez from Galicia, Espana. All right, so Trolls Tijerne wants uh, everyone to hit the thumbs up. All right, so we have Belgrade. All right. Um, so let's see, I just see a question from, from Millard Brown. Hi, Greg, just saw a Clint Eastwood movie with a Toby Keith closing song backed by a nylon string guitar and open D. Uh, the guitar sounded huge without sounding doubled. Uh, any suggestions on how it's done? So a lot of times, uh, you know, if you could, I might be able to give you a more uh, educated guess if maybe if you could send like the name of the song. But one thing that a lot of people will do, you know, a technique is called mid-side recording. 
Uh, and that's where you kind of put a figure eight microphone almost perpendicular to uh, the, you know, to the guitar. And you have one and you put it in like figure eight. So it's almost capturing two different signals. And you have one good, one microphone that's kind of aimed at the guitar. And you take the figure eight, double that channel and invert the phase on one of the channels. So this could require two different microphones, one being a figure eight and one just recording the guitar directly and then kind of bringing up the balance between the two. So, you know, so a lot of people will do some really, you know, great stuff like that, but sometimes it just comes down to, um, I have a friend, Kim person who does, who's done a lot of, you know, she's highly, highly regarded for her acoustic guitar recordings. And, you know, she just, I think she uses like an Earthworks mic going into, I'm trying to remember the mic pre, but it's a really high end mic pre. I mean, she's done like Tommy Emanuel and, you know, stuff like that. She has just kind of the golden ears and the golden touch and probably gets the best acoustic guitar sound of any engineer, but she kind of keeps it very simple um, no real tricks. So sometimes it's the instrument, you know, the engineer, the room, the guitar, kind of th those combinations of all those elements. But if you want to email me a uh, link to the particular track, I might be able to um, give, give you kind of a better concept of maybe how they got that sound. But check out like the MS recording technique. Um, and that could often is used on kind of acoustic guitars with uh, great results. Okay, uh, so a question from Jeff Zabelski. Uh, now on new, so he just is moving to uh, Windows from his Mac, says Cubase Pro. Uh, 11 opens a project and won't see the absolute library on the second NVMe drive twice manage plugins and refreshing fixes, but why not link? So probably the link would be done in a separate program called the Steinberg library manager. So, and this is installed with your Cubase 11. So as soon as you come over here, you can say, okay, I want to go to my absolute sound, which will be a lot of Halian content and what you want to do is, you know, just you could, you know, choose to find if you if you know where the VST sound file is, you could just right click and just say open in the Steinberg library manager. And that will make all the content linked directly with Cubase so that as you know, new files are added, they will automatically be scanned and Cubase will look in those particular folders for you. So, you know, try using the Steinberg Library Manager utility. So it's not necessarily the plugin or where the plugin is installed, but if you just select the VST sound file, right click and just say open in the Steinberg Library Manager, that will make that link and a connection but so that Cubase knows where to look for the content for those particular instruments. All right, so we have people checking in from London. Okay, we have Alex Morgan from LA. Okay, so we just have a question. What is the best way to pitch audio down and up automating like a pitch wheel similar to Ableton? So let's say if I just wanted to take, uh, let's see if one of these samples might be good. Okay, so let's say if I wanna take this pitch here, um, you know, so I'm gonna just go to my sampler control and I'm just gonna drag this into a sampler track so and we could place this into kind of monophonic mode and i could enable legato mode so now what i want to do is to you know as we look at this we can say okay i'm gonna come over here and let's go to like our i think we could set up um 
So if I just, you know, wanted to just play back and let me just not have this muted, that would be helpful. So if you hold down like one particular note, I'll just switch my keyboard here. Sorry for hitting the mic. And you could also kind of set up different glides. So if you wanted to. So this way, as I play, I could just play new pitch and it will, can just, and you could even use the pitch bend wheel here. So, you know, you, and, but if you wanted to, you could have it automatically just kind of play back the particular sample. And as it plays back the sample here, if I hit a new note, it'll just play the sample from the beginning. But if you wanted the sample to just continue on, you could just enable legato mode. So that you could just come uh, right over here and do, so you could do pitch shifting. You could also just take, um, you know, if you wanted to just select the particular file and let's say you go to your offline processing, you could just say, okay, I want to do pitch shift on this particular file. And you can set your range of semitones. Let's say I want it to be an octave and I want it to go up and down within that particular sample. So now, so you can kind of hear the pitch going up and then going down. So you can do also kind of pitch shifting with envelopes there. So there's a couple of different techniques for that. All right, so we see Millard Brown has smacked the like, so that's good. And don't forget, uh, if you want to join the uh, the Zoom meetup afterwards, uh, we posted a link. But I'll post a link in uh, just a couple minutes here. Let me. I'll just post it again. And I'll try to do this about every. 30 minutes or so, so you could join. Let's just make sure. Okay, so let's get back. Okay, so I think I just got the uh, Toby Key song, so I'll be able to listen to it maybe after the live stream. Thanks. All right. All right, so great to see Brian from uh, the Crystal Coast of North Carolina. It's gonna be doing some catching up. You missed a couple of sessions. All right, you see Pablo is doing stuff for the new Gareth song. That's great. All right, uh, so we see from uh, Jeff Zabelski, uh, HSO solo cello part, uh, the first half transposed one octave down. I don't know how, when in score, when highlighting all the notes to transpose back up, uh, brought up an octave, but changed to treble clef. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little cello work here. So we'll go to
Make sure I have the right patch. Okay. Okay, so let's see if I Sorry, okay, let me get my keyboard in the right octave range. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's say. Okay, so let's say I'll just uh, play some nonsense here. Let's say I'll just Let me just, sorry, I have my keyboard on the wrong computer. Let's say I'll just be my free melody for Gareth. Okay, so let's say I have just a little bit of melody. So it could depend on how it was transposed as well, Jeff. So let's say I have this and I'll just quantize it so it's not hateful okay so um so if i wanted to look at this in my score edit so let's say it will start off in treble clef here or bass clef and i'm just Okay, so let's, um, okay, so uh, the first half transpose one octave down, don't know how, when in score, when highlighting all the notes to transpose back up, brought up an octave, but changes to treble clef. Okay, so let's say I'll switch this to page mode. So let's say if I wanted to take th these notes here and I'm gonna transpose them down. So I'll just go to my MIDI and let's do a transpose setup. So I'll say minus 12. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's in range of the instrument. Okay, um, so when highlighting all notes, transpose back up, brought up an octave, but changed uh, to treble clef. So I think even if we wanted to select all the notes and let's say we want to bring these up an octave. So if we now go to our MIDI and transpose setup, so you could do kind of visual transpositions. And a lot of times if you do a transpose in some other areas. So let's say I'm gonna bring this all up an octave. We can see that it's it's maintained the clef uh, without any issues, but if you're transpose, maybe uh, like the first half and you select like your transpose uh, from the MIDI modifiers, let's say, this is only gonna be on playback so as soon as it starts playing back, the first half will play back an octave lower, but the actual MIDI note uh, is the same, but it's just being kind of modified to play back an octave lower. 
So make sure that you have this selected and that you maybe you try to go to the transpose setup and see if you do the transpose there if it, if it makes a difference for you. Um, but you can see that as I've, you know, just wanted to, I'll just set this that back to zero. That, you know, going up or down, when we go to our score editor. So that's up an octave, but it's still, it didn't change the clef automatically, but you could always just double click to the clef here. Or in Cubase 11, if you have kind of the inspector open, you could select the clef here and just kind of manually uh, change the clef uh, as needed. So, but just transposing it shouldn't automatically take the clef, but make sure that you're transposing it correctly with the transpose setup and see if that makes a difference for you, Jeff. All right, so we have Green Sangeet checking in from India. Thanks for joining us. All right, all right. Um, so we see a question, uh, when will Steinberg drop the dongle and let us users be set free? Uh, great workshops, thanks. So Steinberg has announced that they will be migrating to uh, a new license authorization system that will not require. The bell's house, the bell's house okay. is here. Okay. My bell's house is here. Sorry. Let me let me lock my door. My son's very excited. Hang on. Sorry for the interruption. It's my son's birthday next next week, a week from today. So, and we got him a bounce house. So he's been very excited. So, um, but yeah. So Steinberg has announced that they will be having an authorization system that won't require the USB e licensor. It's probably still months off, but you know, uh, hopefully, you know, you don't feel like we've infringed on your freedom by having a USB e licensor. So, but I understand if it's been a frustrating aspect. All right, great to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. All right. Okay, uh, hi Greg, how can I set MIDI editor so when I play drums on my MIDI keyboard, they are locked to 16th note quantize and have 16th note length? So really all you have to do is, you know, you could just put, you see this little AQ icon here. So let's say if I wanted to go to uh, my instrument track, I can come here. Okay, so let's say I just want to put in like hi-hats on this particular instrument. So, so I will just set my uh, quantize value. Let's say I'll just put in snares. Um, I'll just create kind of a blank part here. Okay, so no matter kind of what I what you know so you can enable your auto your auto cue your aq on the transport bar so and i'll just slow down my tempo here so let's say i just want to go uh i'll just slow it way down all right so i'm going to just record uh any aspect here so let's say I'll, i'm just going to record just kind of random notes and my quantize value here is set to 16th notes so now whatever let me it, i'll just move my computer here quickly just so i can get so now when i look at my uh, MIDI notes that I've recorded. We'll see that these will automatically all show up as just 16th notes. So everything will be kind of quantized. 
So all you have to do is just apply the AQ uh, right there and just set your quantize value and that will quantize on input. And you do, probably don't really have to quantize the length of notes, but if you wanted to quantize the lengths, you could also just, you know, come right over here and just say, uh, you know, we could <clears throat> just say, okay, I want to quantize the lengths of the notes and we could choose, you know, your different length values there. So whatever you want it to adjust. So, but just, you know, put the AQ on and then you could just play and it'll quantize on input. And even if you want to uh, go back to the original, you know, it'll just simply come right over here. That's what was played in. And now you could apply the quantize. So you could always go back to the original unquantized value, even if quantizing on input. Uh, so we just see a question, any practical beginners forum streams like this aimed uh, to share learned best practices by you pros to shorten my learning curve using Cubase with Yamaha Modi X8? You know, so any question that you have, um, you're, you know, more than free to ask um, here. You know, it's not necessarily aimed at beginners, but, you know, we'll have you know, beginners questions and, you know, people that have sold a hundred million records on these live streams. So any question you have is fair game. So, okay. Uh, so I just see, hello, Greg, is there a simple way to save a loop or audio in order to use it again in future projects? So anytime that any audio is recorded into Cubase, so let's say I do a new project, I come and I'm gonna put it into, let's say, a March 30th folder. Okay, and I'll just add a couple audio tracks place all of these into record. So now we're recording three tracks into this particular folder. And that audio, once it's on your uh, computer's hard disk, you can now just come over here. Let's go to your media bay. So we see that the March 30th folder that I just created is automatically there. And there's my three audio files. It was automatically updated. So you don't have to do anything special to access, you know, as long as Cubase is, you know, has that particular folder uh, in the media bay, you could just simply, you know, import those into any other project freely. You could also just choose to, you know, import, if you have audio files in a project that you saved is you could import tracks from project and select a particular uh, file. And then that would allow you to import all the tracks for that particular project as well. Okay, uh, so we have, uh, Hi, love this session. How can I humanize MIDI drums in Groove Agent? All right, so let's say, uh, I'll just jump back to particular patterns. There's a number of different ways of doing this. But let's say I have maybe a, a pretty generic uh, drum pattern with this instrument and I'm just gonna drag it to my project window. All right, so now we'll just kind of solo this pattern here. So, you know, if you wanted to come here, you could just say, okay, I wanted to go to like MIDI modifiers 
And then you could say, okay, I just wanted to randomize what? Let's say uh, velocity. So now I could say my minimum and maximum value will be, let's say 60 and You know, let, let, let's say between 40 and 60. So you could just come right over here and choose to randomize pitch, velocity, length, position of notes. You know, so you could do stuff like that. But you could also just come over here and let's say uh, I haven't done any of that stuff. We'll set this back to off. Um you know, you could also use the, you know, just the logical editor to randomize different aspects as well. So I would start with the MIDI modifiers and that will give you a lot. But let's say now, you know, if I wanted to take the hi-hats here, you know, you could just take uh, some of the different aspects. So let's say just... I'll just create my own pattern here quickly just to show a little bit. Okay, so let's say I have And let's say it's like the worst hi-hat of all time. You know, I could just select that, go into a uh, logical editor. And let's say I just wanted to take every F sharp one. So I think I could even just say value one is equal to F sharp one. And then I could say, okay, let's take uh, value two and let's set to random values, which is velocity on a MIDI note message between uh, 60 and 100. So now I'll just say transform. Then I could just randomize the velocity You know, or you could also just say, okay, I want to randomize the position of those notes. So you could say, um, you know, so if you wanted to add to, you know, make those notes later or, you know, randomize the pitch. So if you wanted to now just come here and say, okay, I wanted to take those, let's take, uh, value two or value one of the note message and we can set the random values between um, C1 and C2 and I could just take those hi-hats and disperse them. So you could do stuff like that as well using logical editors. So there's a number of different ways, but I would start with probably the uh, MIDI modifiers. And if you don't see MIDI modifiers, just right click and have that as your option there. All right, great to see Stefan from Sweden and Agent K. I see always kind enough and generous enough to do some moderation for us. I th thought I saw where you may have done some moderation a little bit already. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, we have a question. Hi, Greg. Uh, thank you for doing this. It's super helpful. How to make an effect of switching left and right on an audio track? What plugin is that? How to use it? Have a great day. So, you know, there's a, one thing that a lot of people miss is let's say if I wanted to take uh, a pattern, I'll just do kind of a different pattern here. Sorry, my son is very excited for his bounce house he got. Okay, so let's say I have this particular pattern and um, and I wanted to just automate that particular, like going left to right, you know? So one way if I wanted to just kind of switch the left and right channels of this, is you could switch the panner to a combined panner and this would allow you to kind of pan like more narrowly but one of the things you could do is if i just hold the left mouse button down you could just reverse the panning So that could be like the effect of switching left to right in your audio track and you could just automate that. And I could probably make this like a little, so that's one way of being able to do that, of just taking your whole stereo track and just kind of, and you could do that on a master bus. So, so that's uh, an easy way just to take a stereo source and be able to uh, have that automatically kind of switch the panning perspective pretty easily on that. So, and again, just go to the track, make sure you have in with the stereo track, you have a balance panner, uh, which will do that, but you could also just have the combined panner and just again with the combined just kind of keep going up when it turns orange that means that it's reversed or inverted Uh, hi, Greg. What is the fastest way to convert a stereo audio to mono? So probably the easiest way is, let's say I select the track here. Go to your project menu and you'll see convert tracks. And you can say multi-channel multi to mono. And now that will just take that particular stereo track and make it into two monos. So again, project convert tracks, multi-channel to mono, or you could do the opposite of mono to multi-channel. Okay, so I just see, hi from Connecticut. Uh, I have a, sorry, a lot of plugins that I organize in subgroups. Is there a way to keep my VST folder when I do the yearly update? So, you know, pretty much it's all, you know, your plugin settings will, they'll look at it from, you know, different folders. So if you created these as, uh, your VST, you know, if you go to your VST plugin manager, you know, if you just simply save these as a preset, when you do the update for whatever, you know, 11.5 or Cubase 20, it'll look for the particular preferences, um, you know, to, to migrate over, but you could also go to your edit menu and go to your profile manager and all of your VST plugin uh, groups and, you know, little collections that you've added can be stored within your profile and you could just simply, uh, import that. But generally any, most of your settings will automatically carry over, but sometimes you may need to save it under a particular name. Okay. 
Okay, we see uh, Hi Greg from Atlantic City. Ever consider a tips and tricks or shop talk kind of guide? So yeah, I've, you know, lots of videos. There's a whole uh, Greg Undo Q&A series, which I should be getting a bunch more videos for as well. But, you know, if you have particular topics that you want to see, but, you know, we have that. But we also, you know, I think that this is kind of a, a unique format that, you know, people learn from other people's questions and it's, you know, not us kind of dictating what is being shown, but we tried it for in this format to help you, but check out the, if you get to the Cubase YouTube channel, like the Greg Undo Q and a series, I think there's eight series of videos. There's probably over a hundred videos in there. All right, great to see Gareth on the Hangout. All right, my chat field jumped on me. All right. Okay, uh, so we see from, uh, hello, I'm new to Cubase. I'm, I'm having a problem. Uh, my audio interface is connected properly. Cubase is getting signal as well, but I'm not able to select my headphones as my output. So if, you know, make sure that you're running the, uh, your audio, your headphones are connected to your audio interface. I often get this question. And you know there may not be enough information in a question for me to determine this, but you know when people have like maybe a pair of Bluetooth earbuds or Bluetooth headphones and they want to use that in conjunction with your audio interface, and the Bluetooth will add a you know a pretty significant amount of latency that could be a bit odd and a bit disconcerting and you know kind of you know, a weird delay. So make sure that your headphones are connected to your audio interface and that everything is going to the same stream for your audio routing. And you shouldn't have any problems, but make sure your headphones are connected. And if with an audio interface, it's probably going to entail that it's going to be a wired headphone. So, uh, but that's the best way to do it. So let us know if you Okay, and I just see, okay, further clarification on this. Um, my headphones are connected to my laptop port because I don't have a converter to connect through the interface. So, you know, basically you're telling Cubase to use the audio interface to do all of the routing. So it's not going to send it out to the headphone output port. So, you know, get a little adapter if you need it. I know in the States you can get them at, you know, any number of electronic stores or in, in Amazon, but I'm not sure where you live, but you'll need to connect it directly into your audio interface. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Sub403. <clears throat> Greg, the last hangout, you showed a MIDI logical editor preset to remove the downbeats. When I apply the preset, it only removes the first downbeat. How can I remove all downbeats in this selected MIDI channel? Okay. So let's take a look at that. Um, Okay, so let's say if I'm here and I have, um, let's say a bunch of hi-hats and I wanted to remove all the hi-hats hi on downbeats, let's say beats one, two, three, and four. Okay, so I just wanted to delete those. So how can we do that and not just the one downbeat? So we'll go to our MIDI to logical editor uh, we will say we want to delete 
And we're going to say MIDI notes. And we're going to say our, um, let's see if it is it property is, no, sorry, let me just. All right, no, I'm sorry, in position. Okay, so we're gonna say uh, is equal to, or let's say inside bar range. Okay, so we wanna say type is equal to notes inside bar range. So if I want it to be beats one, and then I just need to add this. And here I'll just choose to do or So again, we'll I'll just choose position. So again, this is just to delete the notes on the downbeats. So I'll just draw in a little bit graphically. Okay, so basically this will say, okay, anything that's gonna be roughly on beats one, two, three, and four. So, so look at my part here and I'll just blow it up to make it a little more obvious visually. All right, so if I did everything right, I'll just come here. And now you can see all the downbeats uh, have just been removed. So, so just kind of graphically drawing like around beats and you may do it just a little bit earlier, or a little bit later, uh, depending on the event here, so I say, okay, that's gonna be, you know, right at beat one. Get it adjust to make that a little tighter if you want, and that we'll be doing it. So again, we wanna choose under function, delete, type is equal to notes, position, inside bar range, and this gives you kind of just a graphic depiction of what one bar is. We see it broken down into 16th notes, uh, and at that point, if you want to make it a little tighter, you could adjust here. And once you do that, then, you know, make it a little tighter graphically, then you're able to just choose to delete notes on the downbeats one, two, three, four. So give that a try, sub 403. All right, see so a nice comment from Graham. Uh, hi, Greg, from Wiltshire in the UK. Thanks for your wonderful wor words of Cubase wisdom. I hope it's helpful. Make sure that everyone hits the like button as well. See how we're doing on time. Okay, so we're doing okay. About another hour to go before we hit... Um, on before we move migrate over to the live stream so i will just go ahead and post the link in again bear with me just for a second All right, so just posted the link one more time. So if you want to join us on the live stream, so other people, we could hear other people talk besides me. All right. Okay, so question, how will the new dongle era affect how many installations on our personal PCs or Macs, for instance? So we, we don't know what the you know, all the details of it. I know pretty much the same details that have been announced, but I know that they, you know, 
you know, they're trying to accommodate, you know, the, you know, both schools of thought where people liked being able to migrate their license to different computers easily with the convenience of a USB e licensor, but not have to carry it. So that's why, you know, that's what that whole team is kind of working on. Uh, and, you know, so the, they're, they're trying to make sure that everyone will be happy with the new system. So it's a big undertaking, as you could imagine. All right, so we see just a comment from Gareth. Uh, Hi, Greg, thanks for the baseline. So hope that was good. It was a fun song to play on. All right. All right, so just read through comments. All right, so we have JB also checking in from North Carolina on his first uh, Cubase live stream. Welcome, and we hope to see you on more of these live streams. Just feel free to uh, ask any questions or just, you know, just watch whatever you want, so. All right. All right. All right. Just reading through more comments. Thanks for all the great discussion. And make sure you hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done that. All right, you see that I'm in a point of discussion where Ryan invaded the hangout to talk about his bounce house. All right. Okay, uh, so just see, pulled my hair out last night trying to get MIDI CC messages to record, turned off quick controls for the track, and missing something about how this is supposed to work. Greg, please help. So if you're recording MIDI CC, let's say if I just have a, I'll just do a new project quickly. Let's do one of the new Imagineer presets because the online music foundry always does such wonderful stuff. So let's say, okay, so let's say if I'm here and I'm just wanting to record um, just some quick. So if I have my quick controls set up, so sometimes if you're using MIDI CCs, you could have MIDI CCs for the particular instrument, or you could choose to have, you know, the MIDI CCs that are going to be for, you know, various, you know, quick control functions. So you could have, so if you have a CC that's being mapped for MIDI quick controls, uh, so let's go to like our studio setup. So if I have this CC that's going to take over when I go to my, uh, my VST quick controls, we can think of this MIDI CC message as being transmitted is kind of being taken over temporarily. So if I wanted to, uh, just come to this, I'll learn this CC message. Okay, I'll go to control two and I'll just move these on my controller here. So let's say I'll do controller three. 
Okay, so right now these MIDI CC messages are controlling, you know, my quick control settings. So as I just wanted to, um, you know, activate my quick controls, those instead of recording MIDI CC data, it's going to record those as quick controls. So again, I will just come here. Let me just learn one more time just to get it right. Okay, so when I go to record, let's say a note. So I'll record a part. So I play a note here. So I move the faders, we see the quick controls. And now I'm gonna move my modulation wheel up. Okay, so all that's been recorded, but when I want to just come into the part and we look at all of the module, you know, I only see the CC data for my modulation that I did. And I believe if we go to, uh, and look at all of our automation, we could just see that, you know, all of the quick controls here have just been, you know, recorded right directly in here. So that MIDI CC message, instead of being recorded as a MIDI CC, is actually going to be just recorded as quick control data so that you can change the sound so it's kind of almost taking over it's interrupting that midi cc message to control these parameters uh so let's say now when i just play back i'll rewind just a little bit here and i move the quick controls these will just all show up as automation but not necessarily as quick, so this is showing up as automation. My modulation wheel is showing up and recording as MIDI CC data. So, but your quick controls, once they're active, can just, you know, record that as automation. So if you're trying to record that MIDI CC into the instrument, you know, it's not going to record in the MIDI track, but if it's that MIDI CC message is set to control quick controls, that's basically going to just record that as automation. So hopefully that makes sense. And, uh, but if not, just let me know. Uh, so question, is it possible to buy software that prints notes on the stave via your fingers on a MIDI keyboard? So yeah, we could do that. You know, we have, you know, two different programs that do that. So if you wanted to uh, do that directly inside of Cubase, you could, let's say if I'm here, I'll just do... And let's say if I go to my score editor, so I could start off with kind of a blank stave. And then if you, even if you wanted to just put in, you know, via step entry, you could do stuff like that as well. So I could say, okay, I just want to put in a bunch of quarter notes. And now as I play in, Let's activate step entry here. I could just, you know, play. Let's make sure I'm reading this right. Uh, yeah, so I just now. I want to change the rhythm to eighth notes, you know, and you could have keyboard shortcuts for this, obviously. And if you wanted to change the clef, you could you know, just come here, say, okay, I want this to be, I want it to be a split staff. So I could just, and if I wanted to now play chords, I could, you know, and you have the ability to record uh, as well. So if you wanted to now just play,
So you could do stuff like that as well and change different rhythmic values. You can also record directly into the score editor. So if you wanted to now at this point, you know, just hit record. So, you know, you could record directly in and then if you wanted to at that point say, you know, the smallest note I intended to play was a quarter note, smallest, you know, rest, you could store all this as presets as well and be able to just kind of play stuff in directly in the system as well. So, so you could do that in Dorco, you could do it in Cubase. Uh, if it's more of like, I would say if your perspective is starting off with a blank stav and composing, that's probably more of a Dorco workflow. But if you want to record in sequence, that's more of a Cubase workflow. And people will go back and forth all the time. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is BIAS FX2 uh, usable in Cubase? So I think there's lots of our users that are running um, that are running BIAS without any problem. So I don't think you'll have any issues. Okay, uh, question in Cubase 11, uh, my recording automatically stops at the end of the locator. How do I change my settings so that the recording continues regardless of where the locators are set? So it's probably set up, you may have punch out turned on. So, and that could be the letter O here. And with the O that would, you know, so right now if I'm recording, um, it's gonna, Let's say I'm recording and we get to our punch out position. I'll just move. So as soon as we get to our punch out position, you'll notice that it will automatically just disengage record. Or let's, I'll take it off cycle here. So let's say if I start right here and we're recording, it'll now just pop out of record because this little icon here is turned on or the letter O. So make sure that you don't have, and it could be like when you go to rewind that you accidentally clicked here, but that will punch out based on the right locator or punch in based on the left locator. And those could work uh, independently of each other, but you could also hit O to deactivate punch out and I to deactivate punch in. So give that a try and I think that will help. Okay, so we have a question. Do you have a recommendation on how to use two different amps in VST amp rack for stereo configuration? I see the option for stereo, but it seems you have to use the same amp on both. So really, if you wanted to have different amps and you have a stereo interleaved file, I don't really have a good example to show, but um, let's say I'll add an audio track. And if you, but if you wanted two different amps on different sides, on let's say a stereo track let me just make sure okay so let's say our stereo track so what you could do is go to the inserts and let's load up to uh, vst amp racks okay so go to distortion VST amp rack. So I'm going to go to the channel setting and in the inserts area you have here routing. So let's say if I want it um, for this amp, I want it more of a Fender esque tone on the left channel and a Marshall uh, on the right channel. 
So what I could do now is we see this little tab at the bottom for routing. We can make each of these mono. And then when you double click here, we could just say, okay. Uh, so we'll say this is gonna be our left channel. So we can say that's connecting there. And when you go to this channel, it's gonna be connecting on the left channel. The right channel is connecting through the Marshall. And then you can have two different amps on different channels of a stereo track. So once again, just go to load the two inserts up, go to the routing. You'll see like a little drop down menu, choose for these to be mono. And then you could double click and that will open up kind of the routing diagram that you could set for each of the different amps. So that will only process on the left channel or the right channel. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Is there a way to filter out what we can download on the Steinberg Download Manager without activation code? I have a Cubase Pro 11 license. I thought I could download everything at first. Uh, laughing out loud, thanks. So just go, when you go to the Steinberg, uh, let me just see if I could get mine open. But when you go to the Steinberg Download Assistant, You know, and just select your Cubase 11. Okay, so if you want to see exactly what's available for your Cubase, like let's say a Cubase Pro 11 license. So I think it's because I have Cubase open currently, but just go to the, your Cubase and then everything here in the Cubase Pro 11 is available for you to use. All of this is licensed with your Cubase 11 license. So all these different components, content sets, instruments, presets, you know, when you go into uh, like all your VST instruments, these aren't necessarily, but you know, included with your license unless you purchase it. And we go to, let's say, you, you know, your Cubase Pro 11 update. So here you can see what comes with Cubase Artist, what comes with Cubase Elements. So everything that's in here is included within your license. So it doesn't give you kind of free access to every Steinberg product, but it gives you quite a bit. Uh, just see, when I try to load the sampler track, Cubase crashes. The only way to make it work is to open the program without any third-party plugins. Any ideas how to fix this? Um, so generally, you know, I would check to see if you're, you know, I, I don't think it's going to be uh, involved with third-party plugins, but I would check to make sure, depending on, like, where you're dragging from, try to make sure, try to see if you're running, if you're on Windows, to see if you're running... Cubase as administrator, and that might make a difference. Okay, reading through comments.
Okay, what's the okay? So a question from Sub Four Hundred Three. What's the difference between drum editor, and MIDI editor, and how can I create a drum editor for my machine? So it's really just looking at MIDI data differently. Uh, so you know, often when we look at a particular part, let's say, you know, for like a bass line or something that was you know more musically based, like let's say you know for a melody. So we have you know, all these different notes here. So it's like, okay, this is our composition, you know, here length matters. We can see kind of the intervalic relationship, the intervals that can make sense musically. But, you know, when we're triggering drum samples, that may not make a big difference. So we could take the same data and look at it in a drum editor. And what the drum editor shows us is more of a grid. So we don't see the length uh, by default, but you could switch uh, that behavior if you wanted to see the length. But you know, the concept is that we could see grids, and you know, many times when you're doing drum programming, you may want to see all the velocity for you know your hi hats independently of your snares, independently of your kick drum. So at this point, you could just pick and choose the different, you know, what you're seeing here. So all you, you know, any part that you have, you could just simply, you know, load it up as a drum editor or a key editor or a score view. It's just a different representation of the same data. So you don't have to do anything special to make your machine just automatically work with the drum editor. All right, so Sub403 wants people to hit the like button. So since we have an abbreviated session today for the Zoom meetup, uh, it'd be great if we get to 100 before we uh, migrate over. So we're pretty close. Thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned something new, make sure that, and you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. So Miller Brown's asking if we missed the bounce house giveaway. So but that would be a good name for a VSD sound set. So Okay, so seeing our question about mono stereo, so I think we covered that already. All right, my chat set, my chat field just kind of went on me. So I have lots of questions. All right, great to see Lawrence from Rhode Island. Okay, so I just see, hello, I want to buy Cubase Elements, but first try the free trial version and having some issues with the eSoft licensor controller. Um, I try all the FAQ that are on the Steinberg page and still nothing. So I think when you get the trial version that you may get a, a download access code. So if you create a My Steinberg account, um, so let me just see if I get on. So you go to my Steinberg here. All right, and then you could just enter the download access code. So I think you get a download access code. And then, so once you do that, then you'll get an e-licensor code. So the, e, so the download access code will give you like the download link and you'll get an e-licensor code. So the e-licensor codes entered into a different program. So, and that will be installed. So make sure that you install the Cubase elements 
And then when you go to the e-licensor program, um, you could just simply, you know, go to enter activation code, uh, and then you could copy and paste that, but you may not see the e-licensor until the Cubase has been installed. So, uh, but give that a try and reach out at clubcubase at steinberg.de if I could be of any more help. Okay, so question. Um, is there a possibility to deal with the events of a specific MIDI track by seeing simultaneously the other tracks too? So I know what I'm going to do, like in the way of orchestral composition. So let's go ahead and take a look at a particular piece. I think we have a couple that we could, let's, this is a big good example. All right, so all you have to do, and one of the great things that many composers love of Cubase is you could select all the parts and just hit uh, like Command or Control E. And now you could see all the different parts. And I'm going to choose, <clears throat> excuse me, clear my throat. And I'm gonna say each part <clears throat> has its own, I want to colorize by parts. So now as we listen to this, then you could pick and choose. So say, okay, that's my cello voice. And if I click here, then I can say, okay, it's gonna be violin. And you could switch between the active parts for editing. So there's my bass part. So now when I do editing and moving of notes, it doesn't affect the others but just of one particular voice that I've selected, but I can still see them in relation to the others. And you know, this is a really kind of fascinating view where you could see graphic patterns going on. You can see kind of counterpoint visualized in really interesting ways. So you can see great compositions will make you know, really interesting visual patterns, uh, just a different way of representing, but just select all the events and then you can just go into the editor and all the events will be visible within the editor. Okay, so question, is there a way of applying a universal LFO tool for plugins on a channel strip? I've used Cubase for 10 years, but never seen such a tool. So let's go ahead and I may not have all my components installed for this, but we'll show you how you could kind of do it. Okay, so you do have an auto LFO plugin that's uh, visible. So, you know, if I wanted to come here uh, for different parameters, and let me just, I mean, I have to do some stuff with my MIDI port setup here. Let me just. But so let's say if we want to do this, so we could do this for different. So as I open up the Alpha plugin, we could have it automatically. So at this point, I'm going to have this automatically do like 
controller seven a dotted 16th notes for volume and to vary and let's come over here to this LFO which will be panning so say if I wanted panning to be at half notes and here in this retro log I wanted to I just have the just to cut off. So this is what's doing it for the base. I'll bypass just the base. So now that's just kind of doing 16th notes. All right, so if we have a parameter maybe that doesn't follow, let's say if I wanted to adjust maybe um, the position of this. Okay, so I could send this out to uh, the IAC bus. So I'm gonna, you need to kind of set this up with like a loop back and I'll probably forget how to do this, but I do have a video on this that I could send you a link to if you wanna email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. So, um, So I don't think I have this still set up, but let's say, okay, I want it to just learn. Uh, so I'm gonna go to this particular controller. I'll just do a new. Okay, so I wanted to adjust the position of this. I'm gonna go to create a MIDI track and route it out to the auto LFO. And I'm going to assign this to, let's say, controller 16. Okay, so this will do 16th notes, uh, or controller 16 will control this. I, I'm going to have the LFO send out controller 16. And that's going, I'm, now what I want to do, if I remember how to do this, is, and I, I realize that this is a little convoluted to do, but you can do it. So we'll go to our generic remote, uh, and then let's say our loopback, and there's free loopback tools that you could have access to. So we're gonna say our address is controller 16, and I want this to control mixer, and we'll choose our glitch drums. And we'll go to our insert, dual filter, and let's just do position, all right. All right, so what I wanna do is just So let's go ahead and just. So now we can see that disposition or any plugin parameter, we have a separate MIDI track that's being sent out to our loopback. And that loopback is now set as a MIDI controller here. And I just clicked on the learn. And that's controlling the position of the dual filter. So let's say if I want that to be uh, 
not to be like every two measures, but I wanted this to be maybe every measure. And I wanted to change the shape of that. So that way you could automate any plugin parameter uh, with the auto LFO and that's just a MIDI plugin, so. Uh, you see, question, is it possible to create key commands to scroll the arrange page left and right instead of having to grab the scroll bar at the bottom? So I think if you just hold down the, um, so let, let's say if I've repeated this a number of times and I wanted to scroll left to right. So I don't think you have to do it at the bottom. So if you just hold down the shift key and use the mouse scroll wheel. So here you could just navigate like that. And I think that you could also Yeah, so try just using the mouse scroll wheel and, while holding down the shift key, and then you can navigate without having to grab this area. All right, so I know we had some questions sent in. Let's get to those. I'm gonna go ahead and post the live stream link again real quick here. We hope that a bunch of people can make it over for the live stream. Okay, so let's get through some of these questions. Okay. Um, okay, so we have Alexander from Russia who wrote, um, how to load a project if your project can't uh, be loaded or if it's freezing on scanning. In previous Club Cubase, you told us that you could check which plugin crashed the Cubase only. See to load project without any plugins. How can uh, how can I see which plugin crashes my Cubase? So if you hold down, you know, you could always hold down Alt Control Shift or Command Option plus Shift after starting Cubase, um, and that you have the option to bypass all plugins. Now sometimes in that screen, if a plugin causes Cubase to crash in that screen, it may say, and this happens about half the time, this plugin caused your Cubase to crash. Um, and that gives you the option to, you know, if you're kind of in this cycle where you can't, um, you know, where you simply can't, you know, get Cubase to load the project because a plugin is crashing it. So sometimes it'll give you that indication, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but it'll show you there if you read kind of at the top and what you do is then save it without third-party plugins. Save that as a project with them all disabled under a different name. And then try to, you know, bring in five plugins at a time and see if you can find the culprit. You know, it's one of those things I know even on a big project it seems like it's, you know, it's that's going to take forever to do. But often when it, you know, all it does is, you know, it may take you... I, I, it's one of those processes that you tend to procrastinate about 20 minutes and then it takes you 10 minutes to kind of isolate the plugin. So, uh, so second question, I am the owner of Ableton 1011. As I understand, can I buy Cubase? Uh, I could buy Cubase by a cross grade, but I know that Steinberg offered do summer sale, do discounts add up. I mean, cross grade plus summer sale works together. So, you know, different promotions work. So, you know, kind of whatever status you have, you know, so if you, you know, did a cross grade from Ableton, we have lots of people doing that. You could, you know, get into Cubase and then upgrade later if you wanted to. So, you know, but I don't know when the promotions are coming out. So. Okay, so we have a question from Jan. Uh, is it advisable to use very audio for guitar? We discovered too late that a guitar was a bit out of tune. Unlucky. So it, 
uh, as it was the best take. So, you know, if you find single notes uh, that are out of tune on a guitar, you could often, um, you know, like if it's on a solo, you could often pitch correct those pretty effectively with very audio. Uh, if it's like one, if they're playing a lot of chords and one note within a chord is a little flat or sharp, that could be difficult. Um, the only thing that might be able to do it would be, you know, maybe, uh, kind of the polyphonic, uh, tuning that you have in some plugins and you might be able to do it within, uh, you know, depending on the part, you could probably, you know, take a look at, uh, just open up, um, project you know you might be able to do some work you know so melodyne kind of has this functionality but you could also maybe do some work within spectral layers too so you know i would you know maybe see if you go into spectral layers and isolate those particular frequencies um and then you you can probably do some some work within spectral layers obviously if you have everything perfectly in tune that's the most ideal but i realize that may not be the best uh the the most practical situation if people are recording remotely okay okay so we have a question uh, a couple questions in preferences general i have auto save enabled with maximum backup file set to five but when i look in a project folder there could be dozens of dot back files. Uh, is this working as intended? Uh, should it be deleting dot back files older than the last five? So often what happens is, and let's say I'm probably guilty of this, where maybe you have different versions of uh, a project. So I go to, let's say, and I can do it with other projects I've gotten from friends as well i'm sure so let's say if i go here uh and if i've saved it as let's say here's probably a good example um you know where people kind of old school may do incremental backups so you may notice that here if we look at the different version numbers that we'll see like you know i think we have like up to you know, six backups, but if you do a save as within the same folder that each version here will have its own five backups. So if you've done the save as, and it's like, you know, you know, my great project, you know, then you save it as that could have, you know, five backups. If you say my great project done, that could have five backups. If you rename it to my great project, final, 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 final that could have five projects. So if you have multiple projects, names, multiple project names within the folder that could have, you know, it's individual backups within each of the, for each project name. All right, question. Uh, in preferences, VST control room, I have show control room volume in transport panel check, but I don't see it in the transport panel. No option to add it in the setup dialog. What am I missing? Okay, so if we want to come over here, so if we see this, um, we see these three little dots, and this is subtle. Don't feel bad because I missed this too when this had changed in 10. So we see these three little dots. And what you need to do is just kind of to bring that over. And when we go to the setup, um, I think it's called input output activity. So it's kind of a, a horrible name. Uh, but if make sure that that is checked, the input output activity. And then you may have to just slide that over just a little bit uh, to the right, just like so. So look at the three dots and kind of move it over, I guess, to the left to expose the control room volume. So you could have it hidden or expose the control room volume with the volume, uh, with the dB indication or without the DB indication right here in the lower right-hand corner. All right. 
Okay, so we have a question. Is it possible to assign slash chords? Uh, I'm current, I'm listening, I'm inserting X chords, but when I double click, I can't find a way to treat the bass notes apart from the chord in a chord editor. Uh, it's not there. I would like to be able to add it as a feature request. So I think if you just come right over here, so let's add a chord track. All right, so I guess the slash chords. So if you wanted to come here, let's go to the editor. So let's say I wanted a C minor chord with a G in the bass. So we see this column here, this for the bass note column, then you could just add the slash chord like so. So let's say, okay, now I wanted to do, uh, you know, G with a B in the bass. So you could just kind of do your difference, you know, just go to this column here and then you could set your different uh, chord inversions right there. Okay. Um, so we see question, I can assign a chord track to certain VST instruments, but how do I assign it to, let's say, three VST instruments of five, but not every VST instrument? All right, so let's say I have these three tracks here. So I'll just hold down Control or Command, and I'm selecting these particular tracks. Uh, and I wanted these tracks to follow, and let's say I'll just go ahead and duplicate these. Okay, so I wanted these tracks to follow the chords, but I don't want the other tracks to, to follow the chord progression. So when we select this, we have those tracks selected. You just go to chords and you say follow chord track. I could just say, let's follow chords. And we can now just click there and say follow directly and only those particular tracks. So when I go to, uh, let's say, you know, this MIDI track, uh, I could select those multiply of whatever is selected. And so, you know, we could just come here, that chord, it, that track is selected chords, but this one that we chose isn't. So you could kind of select your tracks and just from the chord inspector area, you can just switch to uh, choose which ones are actually following the chords and which aren't. Okay, so let me just, and I see I got an email from Johnny Diaz, who also um, wanted me to send a feature request about input metering and for being able to change the color of the numbers. So I'll pass that along, Johnny. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Let's go back to our live stream and we'll get transitioning over to our Zoom meetup in just a couple minutes. Thanks for all the wonderful questions and wonderful uh, discussion. Uh, so I just see from Jeff Zabelski, uh, new to Windows 10, is there a way to force Cubase to rescan MIDI device? Sometimes I have to unplug and reinsert USB to see uh, Motu Express 128. So from Cubase, I think it was Cubase 8.5, uh, that would automatically on Windows just automatically... Uh, you know, scan, you know, it used to be that you would have to restart Cubase prior to, I think it was version 8.5, every time you want it to, uh, like, you know, if you start it up and then you hooked up a MIDI device afterwards. Um, but, you know, but with 8.5 is anything that was connected. So just make sure that your Motu is actually, you know, if it's not, you know, if it's not seeing it in the operating system, then Cubase, you know, is not going to be able to see it. So, um, so see if it's, you know, if it's not being seen in Cubase, but the operating system, that's one thing. But if the operating system is, isn't seeing it, then it's probably going to be something with the Mo2. All 
All right, so we see, uh, what about, question, what about an old computer I have with Cubase 7.5, 32-bit I have for compatibility reasons in addition to the fully updated 64-bit computer with C11? Can I run both in the future? You know, so if you have a license to run, um, you know, your Cubase 7.5, you know, your current license on your USB licensor will work with that. So, you know, again, once again, that, you know, they haven't you know, announced any more details, but they want to make sure that, you know, people aren't going to lose functionality with a new licensing system. So I know that's a big uh, concern that they want it to not lose functionality, but also to, uh, to gain, you know, to gain more flexibility. Okay, so we have a question. How can I record with effect in the monitoring path? Okay, so when we go to the mix console, you'll probably see that you're gonna have different tracks. So you'll have input tracks as well as, uh, you know, your audio channels. So if you want it to record and print the effect during the recording process, you just need to go to the input channel and at this point, you could just go to the inserts and be able to assign an insert. So if you wanted to record through a guitar amp and you didn't want it to record dry and monitor through the VST amp rack, put the plugin on the input channel and then it's going to be applied to the recording. Uh, beware that sometimes some plugins may cause latency that could affect your performance. So just physics. Okay, let's see. Okay, so we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and migrate over. I'm gonna post the Zoom meetup. And if everyone wants to kind of migrate their way over to the Zoom, we'll do the uh, normal live stream on this upcoming Friday. So look forward to seeing everyone there. I'm going to go and post our Zoom meetup here quickly. Uh, one more time into the chat field. And we hope that everyone can make it over. We'll go for about two hours there and then we'll migrate. Um, so we'll just... Get this going, hang on just one second. Okay, so I just posted that in the chat field. I'd like to thank everyone for the wonderful questions and uh, we'll have our normal length hangout coming up on Friday. And uh, I hope that people can make it over to the Zoom part and we will get started there in just a minute. So I'm going to uh, stop, I'm gonna go ahead and log into Zoom quickly here and just in case some people are already over there and I'm going to end the live stream part. All right. So we have Gareth already there. So I'm going to give this a minute or two and we'll have people kind of getting logged in and I'll stop and end the hangout here in just a, a minute or two. All right, so Matthias. All right, so John, Pablo. All right, it's great. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end this part of the live stream and we'll move on. Thanks for a wonderful live stream and I'll see you guys, see everyone on the Zoom. Take care, all right.